share a dirty little secret because you know the, all the insights. Shifted $10 million into an account overseas or something that should have been used for homeowners projects. So, you ever so, have people steal from you? Oh yeah. Saturday morning, we are meeting in the office. Here's all the checks. We're writing all the checks, paychecks on Friday, but there's no money in the bank. Is storm chasing really a sellable business model? Two, two different worlds. One is civil and you know, one is criminal. But. So would you, would you say that market is oversaturated now? We did 25 million in, in, in that storm, which was over a year and a half. Who would do stuff like that? There's a game of chess going on. Smaller funds and smaller groups and smaller P groups and some even individuals that are buying, I don't want to say shitty companies, they need some help. This interview has been probably like, what, five, six years in the making. We had each other on the block list for five years. I've tried for a couple of years to get him sit down for the interview. Would not happen. I actually appreciate this man um, for his damage control. You're amazing how you, uh, how you do your damage control. It does not matter what people talk about you. It does not matter, you know, how big you fail. You always come out of it and, you know, you turn it around. I've watched it so many times. Um, I just want to start with a brief, brief uh, story how we got reconnected. Actually, Lee Hate Fight, out of all things. Uh, funny story, I'm watching in my stories. Someone, mutual friend from us, you might know who it is. I see people watching, like in the stories, watching the fight. I'm like, who is that? I click on it, and it wasn't you. It was another person, I don't even know who it is, but in his video is Anthony Domenico reacting and commenting on... Uh, right, Mike Holmes. Mike it, was, it wasn't Mike Dave Holmes. Dave Liberty. Maybe, Dave maybe. Liberty. So I'm watching and it's like, oh, even Domenico watched the fight. The very next day, uh, Ben Fisher reached out to me. He's like, hey, Domenico would like to do an interview with you. And then Mike Holmes reached out. I'm like, what's going on? And then we connected. Talk, what do you think about the fight? Well, I used to box in the you know in the army back in the day, and then I did Golden Gloves. So, I understand what it what it, when you get in there. A lot of people don't understand when you get in that ring what happens. You know, when a, when that first punch is thrown, yeah. everything disappears. You know, and all you see is that other person, and he's trying to kill you. Yeah, <laughs> and you're trying to kill him, and you got ego involved. So I mean, it's, hats off for getting in the ring, number one for you and Lee. I thought Lee was going to win. I'll be honest, because. I know you guys both trained hard. I thought he was going to win. He should I know you're, won. You're, you're probably stronger, but I always assumed that a guy that had two to three years, four years in the ring experience usually beats the guy who doesn't have the ring experience because they learn how to counter, shift their weight. It takes time to learn how to do that. You know what I'm talking about. I know you trained, but he's probably been in the first ring three, four years longer. longer. So, And in the first round, you could see his skill was greater. Yep. Than yours because he was boxing a little bit in the beginning. He was using his jab, and it was working. And he and I think he I did. have no idea why I did not protect myself. Like I, I saw every jab coming at me. It was like I know what you should do. You well, was should that your, you was should... that your first time in an actual not sparring, but in an actual yeah. fight? Yeah, that's why. So that's why you froze. Yeah, you, you know you should do this. You know you should do this. You know you should do this. And I have a big nose, and I'm like my nose can handle it. Like bring it up. So, you know, I saw the first round. That's what I expected to happen, and I thought he would outbox you. I think um, two things. One is I think he went in too hard towards the end of the first round and came out trying to go for the knockout, and that's sometimes the biggest mistake. He could have played. He could have boxed more. Yep. Not know if that would have worked, but sometimes that, that does work, especially, you know, moving back instead of going in for the kill, um, the knockout punch right away. Then I saw you come out in the second round, and, and you must have learned something in the first round because you still weren't using your jab. You know, you, you weren't using yeah. your jab, but that overhand right, is that what you, your, your yeah. overhand right was a killer shot. And at the, somewhere in the middle of the second round or the end, I remember seeing that overhand right come out, and it paused him. Yep, several times. Actually. Paused yeah. him several, yeah, a few times. And then um, that's when your confidence and your rhythm picked up. And then you continued to use overhand right and, uh, you know, got the TKO and it was clear. Uh, it must have been a hell of a punch. But most guys in a ring, even including myself back in the day, it takes, you know, I'm talking about real fights, not sparring, because sparring's yeah. different. Sparring, different. you know, the guy's not trying to kill you and there's not a thousand people watching to make sure you get killed or the other guy. <laughs> so, so sparring's a little different. But a real fight, sometimes it takes, 
it took me a year to figure out, you know, so you learned, you learned very quickly in that second round. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming your brain yep. was, was, was going into survival mode. And I was very impressed by that. Even though I didn't, you know, you and I didn't, haven't liked each other for many years. It doesn't matter. I still respect the game of boxing and, and art. And, bo and, and both you and Lee went in there to, to really, I mean, you can sure. tell you guys went in there to, to really fight. Because there was some gossip going on that you guys might have been doing a setup to just do an exhibition. He, he, he wanted to box you for many years. He wanted to box everyone. Yeah. Why a couple, did, a couple years ago, I actually was going to do it for fun. Why didn't you do it? Because he stole one of my people. <laughs> I was going to do it for fun. Uh, this was two, three years ago, I think. Yeah, yeah, I remember, I remember that. Yeah. And then one of my guys went to work for him. That worked for me. And I didn't want to support his brand with, with a fun, even a fun exhibition fight. That's the way I looked at it. I was a fun, it was going to be a fun exhibition fight, which would mean it would have been a real fight. But it would have done something for charity or something. But when, uh, I think it was Mike or one of the guys went to work for him for my company, and then I thought, you know what, if you know if someone's going to take some of my people, then I'm not going to go support their brand or mission. So I just kind of. So that that would happen, because BDR accepted it, and um, Bezdem Roofer. So he wanted. To, I remember he he came to me like three years ago. Let's do this, and then he came to BDR. He came to he wanted to fight everyone. It's just a promotion for him. But why did you decide to reach out after the fight? I just. I had I I thought I, was, I wanted to say congratulations Thank for you. learning what you did very quickly in that second round because it could have went a different way. Oh yeah, and I still and I still wonder if he would have boxed instead of he went for the knockout punch. Yeah, he was brawling, and he could have boxed. And I it, I wonder how that fight would have played out if he would have boxed instead of going for the for the knockout. But you never know boxing. You know, one lucky punch can change everything. Exactly, your brain's not connected. Any people people forget that your brain's not connected to anything. And even though you're wearing headgear, people are like you're wearing it headgear. It made it worse sometimes. All the headgear does is protect you from bruising and yes. maybe crushed bones, but your brain's floating in water. Yeah. And so the headgear actually makes your head bigger. Yeah. <laughs> and so when you get hit, that hit is no different PSI than a straight punch. The only difference is you might not have a crushed, a, a black eye as bad, but your brain is still taking that PSI. It's the same. And sometimes it could be worse. And so the, you know, you, the knockout feeling of, of, a, of a punch with headgear is the, is the, same, the same as, as, a, as a normal punch. And, and a lot of people that don't box don't understand that. So um, I, I thought you guys had a great fight. And I, I, I think Mike Holmes was here and Dave Liberty and we were watching it. I said, you should tell Dimitri, uh, you know, tell him he, he did a good job. And, you know, and Lee did a good job too. You guys both did. But, yeah, uh, 100%. Being a novice guy. I still haven't know. talked to him. I reached out. Oh, really? He, he never, yeah. I hugged him. I said, you know, beef settled, whatever. I don't want to, I don't want anything else with that guy as far as like publicly or whatever. As a matter of fact, I decided to even remove like fake guru video. Like I want to take all the content out. Like he showed up, he stood for himself because I see the change. I see that, you know, I watched content after the fight and towards the end, I'm like, that guy is learning. You know, he is a stubborn. We all are, like, in our different ways. But I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be a bigger man. I'll remove the figure. I don't have to do it, but I'll do it just just for the sake of it. And uh, I'm not saying that, you know, we'll never have arguments in the future. Would you ever do a rematch with him? I don't uh, There's no point. There's nothing to prove. I think it'll be stupid. Um, obviously, he probably will want a rematch for me. You know, I want to be done with this. I want to be done with the drama because if we do rematch, even if I lose, it'll be fine. But I guarantee you I will not lose. But if you lose second time, he'll be done. Like it's, I think right now we both look good. He looks good with this fight. There is nothing to, else to prove. We're done. And with me removing all the negative content about him, even after I, you know, won, like because my coach asked me, he said, "What, what are you trying to accomplish with this? Like, besides want to win?" And I said, "I want to be a bigger man before and after the fight, and I want to show determination in the fight, like that. You know, I can stand up for myself." How long did you train before that fight? Like four hardcore? months. Four months. Yeah. So people, you know, another thing people people don't understand, oh, right? but I do that three four months before you get in a it's ring. Nothing. You don't think about anything yeah. but that. Like you don't do your normal work almost. You don't think about. Well, if I you're really if you're really in training mode, you wake up. Pe and people don't realize I watch hours and hours per like I watch interviews, podcasts, 
like you know your Mike Tyson's and stuff everything like I was consumed with it like I have two boxing coaches I have two practices per day I lived and breathed boxing for a couple of months how you do anything is how you do everything that's why I won because I you know I did not my biggest problem was I did not want to win win I wanted to look good I want to look decent for the four months of training and honestly that two overhead like I learned it like a week before like f f fun fact I'm watching Bitter Beef Smith fight week before. So Saturday night, our fight is Saturday and Saturday before Bitter Beef, Russian, he's from Chechen, uh, Chechnya, but he's Russian. Uh, so he fights, it's his 20 fight here, 20 for 20 knockouts. He's like a champion, 175 pound, you know, amazing fighter. And I'm watching that fight and I got hooked on that guy because he throws two, like when someone tries to jab him, he goes two over, right? I'm mesmerized. I'm like, how does he do it? Come to my coach and say, teach me that. Like week before, next three practices, all we do, he jabs me and I throw uh, two over because we did not practice that shot. We did, you know, your jab, your, your left hook, your upper. Like there's so many things in boxing. You have to have two, three shots that comes natural to my, you. My favorite punch is always the left hook. I love it too. And we practice it for like three, four months, but I never practiced the two over. And I said... Uh, teach me that and we start doing it we practice for the past three of like practices before the fight that's the only thing i did and then uh last three days i didn't do anything and somehow it connected like you, my brain remembered because i saw him jabbing me and i'm like i have to do something with it usually i would do jab and you know in the return but then somehow it was not connecting and i tried my two and it worked i actually my number one punch that I trained for four months, it's two to the body. You know, I hurt everyone I sparred with. My coach says, you're gonna knock him out with a punch to the body. I knew he has weak core and I have very strong two and one. I did not throw one <laughs> punch to the body in that fight, not single one. And the only thing I did was a two over that I learned like a week ago. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it but but it, but it connected. Like it takes one. It only takes one lucky punch sometimes yeah. to make. To oh, it was. War, uh, I think I got like two, three in the last round. But total oh, yeah, like maybe it. like ten. Yeah, there like you would, It was many. So let's get to you. To your story. You remind me. I watched a lot of Mike Tyson actually, and as I'm watching Patrick Bad David did a few interviews with uh, Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson have changed, and he reminds me of you more than anyone. Like I was thinking of, like. Dalmatic, who he is, like, is a category. I'm like, he's Mike Tyson. You have wild past. You know, you were crazy. Not only your parties, but the way you live your life. And now, the way I see you, you're seeking peace. You're seeking something different. Like, if you watch Mike Tyson, he still have that inner man that wants to come out. And Mike Tyson is like, no, you have to stay down. I watched recently his interview. He's like, my wife does not let me go to the clubs. I can't go to the clubs. <laughs> And like, you know, I'm a grown man and I cannot do what I want. And you can see that struggle. And, and he's still freaking Mike Tyson, mm -hmm. but you can see he's a changed man. And when I think about you, that's what I see now. I actually talked to several people and I want to touch on all of that today because, you know, I don't care what you say about yourself. When I ask people about you, I'm like, did he really change? And, you know, we'll touch on it. But first, <clears throat> let's start with your career. Um, you started a lot of businesses. How many companies have you have total? Started or now? Uh, um, I would say, so you, you've been a business owner. That's your claim to fame, right? But total, how many businesses have you been involved that was 100% you? Over the years, probably 15 to 20. I mean, you go, you got to go back far. I mean, I had, a, sure. I had a valet company when I was in college. I had a uh, always been an entrepreneur. I had a promotion for nightclubs company when I was in college, helped promote uh, bars in the local area. I had a company when I was sixteen. It wasn't a real company, but the real, the first real company where I was actually making money is probably in college, a valet company, and then there were several companies I started over the years. It's a little security business once, um, different things. Out of everything you've done, what are you the most proud of? What company have you built? that you are the most proud of. I've done that and I'm proud for that. I, I think, you know, from a impact standpoint, there's there's a couple, I mean, you know, WTS SVG, um, 
contrary to popular belief or an unpopular belief, made a made a big impact in the industry. You know, bringing folks together, putting a spotlight on a on a storm restoration industry prior to that. So I mean, that was, I'm pretty you know I'm pretty proud of that. But there's there was other things. There were other businesses I did that weren't didn't do well financially. Um, 2008, you know, 2009 during the recession, I launched a, a toy stand for kids. It's called the Little Green Money Machine. It was a it was a multi purpose business stand. It won awards. It came with a book. Lost a half a million dollars on there. You know, I I never I never produced enough revenue. I made made the product in China, and I couldn't produce enough units in China to bring the cost down to an acceptable level to get it into big box retailers like Toys R Us. So you know, half a million dollars into it, I, I pulled the plug on it. But uh, it won awards, and it was it was a, it was a you know, for the kids that did buy it and have it, it was a cool thing to help kids that were, you know, eight, nine, ten years old launch their first business. So, you know, there's, I think all, all the all the businesses were something I, that I believed in or had fun with, but those two were those two in particular made an impact. What's the highest point of your career as far as the, like revenue goes? Like, what the year that was that you felt success? Was it storm chasing years when you were like, you know, I made it this year or I made it like the highest point of your career? Yeah. The second, you know, the second year when I was a storm chasing salesman, I did really well as a salesman before I became an owner, you know, back 99, 2000, the second year in 2000, you know, I made, you know, I think I did close to 400,000 in sales commissions. That's the first time I made a so good much. chunk of money. You know, I, I came from 400,000 is a lot, a lot of money. A lot, of you, business, you, a lot of business owners don't realize the pot earning potential of the sales rep versus the business owner. Without the liability. Yeah. Now that next year, I went and opened my own business like all sales guys do. How much did you make money. for yourself when you did that? Well, the first year in business, which was Abelard Construction in Minnesota, there wasn't really a storm. So it was kind of doing oddball jobs and you know, it, was, it wasn't a big storm year. But that second year, um, Columbus, Ohio got hit in 2000. Two, April 2002. And we had gone there in the winter and set up a relationship with uh, Able Roofing, which was like the $20 million retail company in town. Um, and they were just happened to be launching a franchise division. And so when we came to them and said, hey, we want to be your franchise or your, you know, your set or your joint venture partner, they're like, wow, this is wonderful. We're launching a franchise. And so Brian and I went to uh, Columbus and we, we did a, it was one of the few times I've actually done a joint venture because I usually was Abelard Construction. But in that particular city, it made sense, and we did uh, we did twenty five million in, in, in that storm, which was over a year and a half. So yeah, I think it was eighteen million the first year, uh, seven million on, on year two. That was the second year as a business owner. So that's a that's an, uh, you know I know that a lot of guys you hear these crazy numbers fifty million, hundred million. Look back then. That was a lot of money. It was a lot of revenue. I learned a lot about. But also prices were much cheaper. Like twenty-five million back then is like probably six to seventy now. Oh man, it was. It was. I mean, it was. But we grew so fast. You know, this, how much were you know you getting for roofs? Like three hundred bucks a square. I was getting elk shingles. This is before GF bought elk like for thirty-six. Bucks? No, thirty-six 30. bucks a square. Thirty-six bucks. What a square. was the pricing? Like how much insurance paid? All together, two seventy-five to fifty. Yeah, we're probably getting four or five hundred a square. Really, back then. Back yeah. then, and with overhead and profit and all that stuff, it depended on the on the claim. Sure. But, uh, we skyrocketed in Columbus, Ohio, and it was. Uh, it's a good market. Yeah. Even to this day, there's so many big companies coming from there. I mean, they go elsewhere too, but Columbus High, it's a gem. Well, one of the salespeople that I hired, he was a military buddy of mine. That came back from overseas. His name was Leo Roberto. He was a. He came back from overseas. We put him in sales. You know, Columbus, Ohio, he came up through sales. He ended up buying Fiesel Roofing, which is now one of the largest roofing companies in Columbus, yeah, a couple Ohio. Hundred million dollars. And now he's part of a PE capital group buying other companies. So when you think back to, you know, there's been so many sales associates over the years that came through our umbrella or our company. All or storm, chaser, storm chasers do is breed competition, honestly. Oh, yeah. It's but it's but you guys bring it to yourself because it's all 1099s. You don't really you know, the, the reason you guys do it because you train them to do everything. And then at one point, sales rep. Well, I think, I think asking I agree, and, do I they need agree you? and disagree though. I think even if you W two'd them sure. and tried to put a non-compete, but I if think you don't have a leverage, if you door knock, if the you human nature though, of a 20, cause the average sales associate for roofing restorations, storm or non-storm is a guy in his twenties, early thirties. Okay. 
And human nature is they're going to migrate in three to five years, two to three years, no matter what you do. Nobody, humans been migrating for 250,000 years. So the thought that someone's going to stay with you for 20 years or 10 years, that's not the right way to think as a business owner. You should assume that in two to three years, someone's going to get the itch. Someone's girlfriend's going to move to Montana. Someone's kids are going to go over here. Someone might want to go do something else. Someone might want to become an entrepreneur. And you have to accept the fact that people are going to migrate. So sure. I, I think that's okay. And, and I think one of the reasons I launched SVG later on, by the way, because I saw we're creating so much competitors over the years or guys learning a system, go start a business. I'm like, why not just go help them all? And so when, I, when, I, when Brian and I split up in 2012 um, with Abelard, you know, we, we went our separate ways. Um, he was actually here a couple weeks ago, first time we talked in 10 years. Wow. So I told you, yeah, it was pretty interesting. You, you, you're making up a whole bunch of connections. Oh, there. yeah. We hadn't, we hadn't seen each other in 10 years. So he was, he was here uh, wow. two, two, the, night, the night before you fought. But <clears throat> when him and I parted in uh, 2013, you know, I didn't want to get back into brick and mortar contract. I was kind of, you get, you get exhausted from it, from the people leaving, from the storm chasing and all that stuff. And I uh, launched SVG because I'm like, might as well join them, meaning help everybody. And that's kind of that's kind of one of the reasons uh, we launched SVG back in the day was was basically to help not sales associates but entrepreneurs sure, launch growth scale own. move into the storm you know the storm restoration industry and how to how to how to navigate the insurance claim world and all that kind of stuff. So let's talk about your record. So in your book, you uh, you claim one hundred and seventy nine million dollars in sales. Is it Abelard? So eighteen states, eighteen years. Abelard Construction. Not 18 years, uh, 2001 to 2013, so 12 years. 12 years. We averaged 15 to 17 million a year. Maybe one what, year we had 25 million. What minutes. was the best, the worst markets for you? Well, Minnesota was a good market throughout different years. You know, we were primarily storm restoration, not retail. So Minnesota, when there was, when there was a storm, Chicago. Back in the day, it was very good. Northwest suburbs made a lot of money. What's there. your take in Chicago now? Well, all these markets what, what, are now saturated with, with, the with storm restoration contractors. So when I was there in the early 2000s, it wasn't like that. Uh, Columbus, Ohio, nobody knew what a storm chaser was. In 2002, it didn't exist in Columbus, Ohio. We called that a virgin, a virgin market. So would you would you say that market is oversaturated now? Oh yes, very, very much. So. I think most people agree with that. I mean, in, in a, I might be part of the reason that happened by launching, you know, the book, Win the Game and the, and the SVGU. But when you go in there and, and be, well, you're like, we went to Columbus, Ohio and made such an impact there. People leave, they start businesses, other people saw what we did, they learned. Naturally, when you have a big storm or a big hailstorm, then you're going to have storm uh, contractors, even local ones that start understanding the storm restoration model. But like, Columbus will never be like it was in 2002, because even by 2005, it was, a, it was getting a little saturated. It's much more saturated now. Same with Atlanta. When we went to Atlanta in 2008 and opened up, Brian, it was Brian and I there as well. Um, really not a lot of storm restoration contractors in Atlanta in 2008, just maybe two or three in a whole city that we even knew. And now you go to Atlanta and there's hundreds, you know, there's literally hundreds of contractors that are primarily on the storm restoration model. So we liked going to cities that were fun, cosmopolitan cities like that, using the storm model for Abelard and really doing some research. Like we never went to Dallas, Texas. We're like, no way, no way would we go there. It's Why? Too much competition. So it was already, cause even in the early 2000s, Dallas, Texas was, was just like it is today. It was full, that's where storm, that's where storm chasing came from. So it's very hard for a, a guy or a guy from Minnesota to go down with a sales team in Dallas and compete in Dallas, Texas. I mean, that's a, that's a very competitive market. Now there's guys that have done it, more power to them, just not for us. We preferred to find cities that weren't very uh, saturated with storm restoration contractors. So we liked, you know, Columbus, Ohio, um, Louisville, Kentucky back uh, 2010, um, St. Louis in the early days, 2001, 2002, first time a big storm hit, you know, St. Louis, uh, Chicago, Northwest suburbs of Chicago. I mean, there was a couple players there, but not like today. I mean, now there's hundreds, there's literally hundreds in those cities. But back then, we'd find uh, Chantilly, Virginia was another one. You know, Maryland. Yeah, that's still a, what I call a, it's still, a virgin it's a good territory. Market. Yeah, it's a good market. You know, it's almost. I see a lot of companies scale super fast. It's almost recession proof there because we we had an office there during the recession, did very well because you got retired generals, 
you get all the politicians that retire. They, they tend to stay there in Montgomery County and Washington, D.C., you know, and they, they still have money. So even that's a great retail market out there. But when we, when we went there in 2010, 2009, 2010, with a storm restoration mile, again, not a little hailstorm hit, went there. I thought, wow, what a great market. A lot of big homes are in Montgomery County and uh, Bethesda, Maryland and D.C. And, and uh, so we tended to go to places that were not so saturated with storm. And then we wanted to keep the brand. The, the idea was to keep the brand there and grow. And that's one of that's the way we used to grow. Our, our... Why didn't you sell your business? Like t time is different now. I'm pretty sure you're looking at it now. Like if you would do it all. We tried twice. You tried. Yeah. We tried in, uh, in 2006, we were in, in Orlando, Florida. We moved our headquarters there because of Hurricane Charlie, 2004. We went through a, a reverse, we got an offer from a, a publicly traded company. It was a reverse shell merger company. One, it was a penny stock company, company from Dallas, Texas, actually. And uh, we went through the whole process of due diligence, blah, blah, blah. Come to find out it was a pump and dump scheme. And I didn't really like the players. This is one of the reasons Brian and I, Brian and I got in our first big argument was in two, was actually in two thousand six. He was he was all about the uh, the river, the, IP, the reverse shell merger IPO and the buyout. I was very skeptical because I didn't something didn't seem right, and it literally almost ripped our company apart because we were already he was we were already transferring uh, resources and people over this company. And finally, I, I ended up signing the LOI, and sure enough, a couple months later, it all fell apart because it was a pump and dump scheme, and then we had to reassemble the company. It was a mess. Oh yeah, horrible. So that was my first experience with trying to sell your company. Fast forward to 2012, 2013, when him and I, uh, I, had, I had gone to Australia for three months and done a joint venture operation out there, lost a <laughs> quarter million dollars on that, but it was fun. You know, we went out there with 10 sales associates. How is the market in Australia? Oh, it's, it's great for hail. It's just like Texas. Really? Hail's like this big, yeah. But how is the insurance companies and stuff? Is very, this, very uh, socialist. So they're very much like Canada. They use a preferred uh, contractor system. We were the first ones to introduce this idea of a contingency agreement and knocking a door. That doesn't make, people don't knock doors out there. It doesn't, you know, if somebody files a claim, a preferred contractor shows up from the insurance company. So they don't have to use a preferred contractor in Australia. They can use their own contractor, but it's just nobody ever heard of that before. So we were very disruptive over there and they were very excited for, for us to leave. <laughs> when, my, when my visa ended, they made sure I couldn't come back there. But, you know, we did leave some sales guys back there. They actually, there's still a couple guys that live there today that oh. are selling for some company. So but you come back, what happened to your company? I came back and me and uh, my old business partner uh, had irrevocable differences. He's, he's still he, in business? He's still in business in Indiana. Okay. Doing well, yeah. Restore is his company now. But we had just, you know, it had been going on for probably a year or two. I think when you've been when you've been business partners with somebody for 10 years, 12 years, you know, it's like a marriage. You're talking about it's a we did a you know, we had 50-50 LLCs. We never did an op agreement because we were best buddies. When you're going like this in business, everything's going great, you're best friends. But when when you have differences of opinion, maybe when business slows down, that's when sometimes the friendships don't hold up like like they do in the heydays. And when you decide to sell your company, that's a very good point. How do you sell your How do you sell your company when you and a business partner are no longer talking, or you're having irrevocable differences? You're like, "Hey, I just don't agree with you anymore," and you stop talking, and you don't have an op agreement, which is a, which is a buy sell agreement. What do you do when you break up? We didn't have that because we were always we always got along. There's only one thing to do after that: close the company, dissolve. You can't sell a company that somebody owns unless you buy it from the other person. And so what we did is we, uh, in 2012, 2013, he, in his, you know, he had five states under his control, I had five states under mine, we built the rest of the jobs, closed down operations. He went launched, uh, I think it was Restore, and I made a decision not to get back in brick and mortar because I was in, I was just, uh, you know, you get that angst and that anger and you know, I was going through a lot of stuff at the time and that's, so that's why I launched SVG, just to move in a different direction. Is storm chasing really a sellable business model? I see a lot of equity firms coming in, and some equity would only buy a retail. Some do buy invest in, you know, storm chasing. But I also see a lot of storm chasers, you know, try to sell, but 
after the due diligence, after looking at their books, they don't have a sellable business. I even biggest players, like even you know companies like CMR, right, hundred million, 100, like plus fifty million dollar companies. Well, because they so they should have sold a year ago. They, they should have. <laughs> Uh, but but what what was the business? Because you have all this you know sales well, you, guys. You, yeah, because we just funny we just had an exit strategy boot camp in here, and there's there were some different business owners, there were some contractors here. But one of the things these PE groups are looking for that a lot of storm restoration contractors can't provide is is a is 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 consistent growth, three year growth. And so even when I was a stormer, the only way for us to keep out of the we call it the bell shaped curve. You know, when Minnesota slows down, there's no storm for two years. And you're not, and you don't like retail. What are you going to do? You have to chase the next storm to pick up that bell-shaped curve. If you're really, really, really good at that, and we were, we were pretty good for ten years. I mean, you had to, we we were on the road. You have to be on the road perpetually to do this. So you have to. You travel. can keep your EBITDA and your moving average up, but most of the PE groups that are buying these companies right now, like Sam Struthers and in these different groups, they're not. They're still not interested in this. What they're interested in is a guy like Scott Ropo. In Denver, yeah. okay, he under he was a storm chaser back in the day, and he understands storm restoration. But he's really a storm catcher. Storm catcher is somebody who's he doesn't really leave he didn't really leave Denver. He has a steady business in Denver. He's got licenses in other states, but he wasn't really chasing all those places. He's really focused on his business in Denver, which included multifamily retail and the storm restoration model. So you have to diversify. Yeah, I think they so when you when you hear about these, I you know because I've talk to some of these guys at Exit Strategy, they like the storm restoration model because it's explosive in revenue for a little bit, but they like the company who's also embedded in retail too. They don't they don't necessarily like the storm restoration contractor that has to move from state to state to state. That's not what they're buying. They're looking for the storm catcher type that understands storm restoration, but also has a book of retail business or something steady they can sink their teeth into. What's your take on all the equity mining that comes in the industry right now? Is it? I think it's crazy. It is crazy. It's insane. See, you look, 10 years ago, like when I went through that reverse yeah. shell merger in 2012, um, Brian and I, when, the, when we did talk, we did for a minute try to sell to a company. I just forgot about that. We did try to sell it one time to a company. Our financials weren't right yeah. for the reasons you just we just talked about for them to sink their teeth into it. And that's and then we ended up going into to the other mode. But um, I think it's crazy. You know, the last three years, really. Insane. Is, is when it's Billions exploded. and billions of dollars. But but they also see not only good. So they come in. I mean, they pretty much want to buy everyone. So every company gets five, ten offers. Like if you're doing a couple million dollars a year, you get offers, right? Like, But then it's, it's a soft offers. It's not really offers. It's like, oh, we want to buy you. Open the books, you open the books, now they don't want to, but what I see is they buy the companies and then a year later they sell them back. There you go. There's, so there's a game of, there's a game of chess going on. And the one is the big, big PE groups that want the perfect 30, 40, 50 million dollar roofing company with retail business, perfect books. Yeah. That's like Jason Berg's uh, group up there, uh, yeah, yeah. All Star Morgan Stanley, okay? Yep. If you don't fit that model, they're not gonna buy you. So they're very, very, very picky. So there's a couple players like that, big ones, okay? But most companies are not like that. Now there's a sub chess group going on. And that's smaller funds and smaller groups and smaller P groups and some even individuals that are buying, I don't want to say shitty companies, but they're buying companies that look like they're okay, they're not like that yet. They need some help. And they're buying them on a discount. And they're, and they're, and they're throwing in some resources and tools to help them grow so that they can possibly get to a level to be bought out by the other company. And that's actually not a bad, that's a good place to play in. Yeah. Um, I wish I would have, you know, in 2012, I wish I would have had one of those companies approach me, but nobody wanted, nobody wanted to touch those companies. Yeah. There's a huge game of people doing that underneath the bigger groups. And there's even, you get this, there's even companies that are, I don't want to say their names, <laughs> that they're going right after the salespeople and offering them deals. Because really, if you're, let's say you're a storm restoration contractor, yeah. retail contractor, look, you got production, you got accounting, you got a brand, and you're running that well. The bigger group, the bigger company that's 50 million or the PE group already has all that in place. And it's probably way better than what you're doing. This comes a smaller company. So what do you really have to offer that PE sales group? Guys. The sales guys. And so they're making offers to, say, to this company owner. But if he doesn't nibble on it, they're like, you know what? We'll just go after all their salespeople. Cash bonuses, sign up, da 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 da, and they take their whole sales team. That's going on. Um, 
by at least four or five different groups right now. And it's, I mean, I think it's pretty, pretty, pretty vicious, but for, if you're a sales guy, it's a pretty good deal, I guess. You know, you get a bonus, you come on, you get, they match your commission rate. So there's that game going on. So there's a game with, you know, there's a game of check. I call that the checker side. That's the checkers level going after the salespeople. Then you got a little, uh, a light chess going, going after the small players that need help that are getting uh, really, a, really, they probably really need cash and they're buying at a discount for that geographical license. And they're going to flush, they're going to flush some resource money there and blow it up and, and then probably flip it. And that's a great deal for a struggling contractor or a guy that just can't get off the gate to ever get to that level to sell. That's really the place to, to play in, I think, is a, is those smaller, uh, the smaller PE groups and funds and some of the individuals that are willing to buy the struggling company. That, that could really help some guys out. In the storm restoration business, we always talk about millions and millions in sales and how great profit margins are, and that's what attracts all of the competition. Uh, share a dirty little secret, because you know the, all the insights why so many big companies lose money and go bankrupt. And I'm talking about like, you know, Able in Atlanta, $60 million company. If you hear about it all the time, like Excel, $25 million company, just a couple of years ago folded. Why these companies, despite the fact that they're doing freaking crazy numbers, 50, 60, 70 million, close the doors, can't pay that, cannot pay well, suppliers. Well, it's, it's actually easy. So take take the word 50 million. So right, right away on 50 million, we know that Let's use, yeah, 50 million. So we know one third labor, one, one third's going to labor, one third's going to material, but it's actually more than one third material because material price has gone up. It's, it's material's actually higher, much higher than labor. It used to be one third, one third. So they're already losing right out the gate without overhead. They're already losing more than two thirds, you know. I mean, not losing, straight they're cost. spending. It's... And then they got, you know, and then they got profit coming. Now you got overhead, you got marketing, you got all this stuff. If you don't know how to manage that cash flow, and so it's just money me, management. You know, I, I got an MBA from Carlson. University of Minnesota. So you learn a little. You learn, you learn enough to talk good, but you learn a little bit about cash flow and, and financial management. Let me tell you, those years running Abelard, there were many, many, many times where storm or no storm, it's Thursday afternoon, and I'm wondering how the hell I'm going to make payroll tomorrow. How Not many? every. So when you say 25 million, you could say yeah, at a 25 million dollar year, but you could be in 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 March. And you just happen to pay a lot of material bills and pay this and pay that. Maybe you got one what, little. What, what do you do in that situation? Like, how often did it happen to you on a Thursday you don't have money for Friday? Well, I mean, I could, you know, 15, 20 times over, over a 10 year period for sure. So, what do you do? Sell personal assets? No, you just Neg you, negotiate. You, no, you get creative. You, you, you operate in a float. You learn how to operate in a float. The float means you know that you got receivables of 300,000 maybe sitting out there. You go, okay, guys, we're going to go pick up some money. We got, we got 300000 sitting yeah. on people owe us. Saturday morning, we are meeting in the office. Here's all the checks. We're writing all the checks, paychecks on Friday, but there's no money in the bank. So you hope, we better hope we get it in by Monday. So you take a group effort. You put your sales guys in on Saturday morning. You go knock on Mrs. Smith's door. Hey, yeah, I'm holding that $13,000 check because my gutter's got a dent in it. I'll give you $500 off your thing. And so you teach your sales guys how to collect money or you, you get your AR manager. But, you know, you, you focus on it's your a team AR. Effort. And sometimes, sometimes these companies let their AR go or they let their sales guys collect the check. Worst thing in the world is let your salesman manage your AR as a company. And a lot of companies do that. I used to, too, in the beginning. And you've learned how to well, follow. Why is it a problem? Well, because if a, I was a salesperson, so, and I, and I, prided myself when I was a salesperson on collecting and closing my own jobs out. And a lot of guys in the industry, they, they allow their salesmen to collect and close their jobs out. And a salesman should go help pick up a check. But you should always, once you get over three, you know, two or three million in sales as a company, especially by five million, you should have a dedicated accounts receivable manager that's watching your lean clock, that knows when last trade's complete, because that's when your 90 days starts, that's sending out those invoices, that's going after the insurance claim, release depreciation, or just invoicing your retail customer. Because if you leave it up to Johnny, and Johnny, let's say Johnny just got a, a $6,000 or $10,000 commission check on Friday, and he's going to Mexico for two weeks, do you think going to pick up that $13,000 check from right. the other customer that's mad, or that customer doesn't like them? So when you times that by 10 states and 100 salespeople, you could have a massive AR problem by having your salesmen be in charge of, of AR and collections by themselves. Whereas if you have a dedicated accounts receivable department or manager, just like any big company, you have to, you know, especially with lean clocks, you gotta monitor your lean clock. So you so what so what I'm what I'm telling you is I don't think what I just told you is anything 
you know, a lot of guys don't talk openly about that, but I bet anybody in contracting has experienced a Wednesday or Thursday when like, 100%. oh shit, I got to make a couple of calls. I'm not going to be able to pay this bill. And, and I wonder like a how, failure too. how am I going to pay my team? I mean, when you really, when you really experience that, that's when you become good at better at cash flow management. And so a lot of that has to do with accounts receivable. And some of that has to do with just cash flow management. Sometimes guys spend too much money on themselves. The owners. You know, I spent a lot of money over the years on, on silly things. Um, some of the things you touched on in a couple of your YouTube videos, we can talk Give about that example. later. Well, I was, I lived a very extravagant lifestyle. Now I always put business first. So I never like, like, well, would you, did I, did Brian and I buy a, a 45 foot yacht and carver and motorcycles and boats? Yeah, we did all that in Columbus, Ohio, but you know what? We, we had the money too. the money, the money was flowing. Did you ever so, have people steal from you? Oh yeah. I've had all kinds of stuff. Give me a crazy, I'll, I'll start with one. Uh, you touched on sales guys getting commissions. I have a sales guy who started his own company. I fired him, long story short. I actually took him to small claims later, won the case, but six months later, what my it was my f first tough summer, same thing. Friday, don't have 50K for the payroll. I, I did not know where the money is going. Six months later, January, Lady comes to the office, say, hey, Dimitri, I've never paid you guys. You did the work and stuff. I take the check, open the QuickBooks, and I see that QuickBooks payment has been recorded. So the, this, <laughs> imagine sales guy, and it was my fault, my mistake. I let the salespeople access to QuickBooks to collect the checks. Oh, so, so he collected it so he can connect, uh, so he can get $500 freaking uh, commission. <laughs> imagine, but without collecting the check. But the homeowner was honest enough to bring the check six months later. They, I guess the check was burning them. It was insurance claim. They're like, oh. I can't live with it. So the whole, that's how I found out what the, what the sales guy was doing. And for me, like, who would do stuff like that? I've had several <laughs> sales thefts, but the worst theft we ever had, and, you know, I'll go back to, to Brian. One of the reasons him and I split up was uh, due to this issue here. But we hired a accounts payable manager, CFO, a lady by the name of Becky in 2010, 2011. And she ran some of our accounting on, on Brian's offices. She's now in prison. Her name's Becky. She came from Tecta, one of those big roofing companies. Yeah, yeah. So she seemed like a very trustworthy accounting type person. Accountants are the worst. And oh. family accountants, even oh. the worst. <laughs> I was gonna say, if any roofing contractors are watching us right now, always, I'll just tell you one little thing, hint, always have a third party or someone other than who's writing your checks and running your QuickBooks do month. It's called month end re reconciliation. It's so easy to steal too. And there's people that'll do that. It, it, a separate person should be month end because it, whether it's your girlfriend, your, your, your wife, your best friend, your auntie, the, the, the innocent lady, the, they'll pay their credit cards. They'll get so creative. I mean, you, you always gotta do, <laughs> you always gotta do month end reconciliations because sometimes you know, there's a lot of theft and there's and a lot of, and especially in the contracting industry, and there's a lot of theft on the salesperson side, but the bigger problem is actually the uh, one you don't I know agree. about. It's the accounting ones. And it could be a third-party accounting company, which is why you always have a third, another third party do month-end reconciliations because they catch everything. And it only costs for a couple hundred bucks a month to have another company do this. They just do a month-end, maybe, you know, maybe it's 500 bucks a month. But very important. Now, this gal, uh, Becky, she's now in prison, by the way. She had set up fake subcontractors that look like, you know, when you see checks going through for like Julio Chavez or whatever, yeah, yeah. or Juan Lopez, and you're used to seeing that name. So you see 10, 15, 20, 30 grand going to Juan Lopez. You're used to, you know, he's your subcontractor. You're just used to it. So she set up something like Juan Lopez one or Juan Lopez dash two or something. Yeah. LLC, some bank account. And she was literally writing, you know, bilking a company tens of thousands, maybe a couple hundred thousand, maybe, maybe it was into the hundreds of thousands. And um, eventually Brian caught it on his office. But these are one, again, we, I knew there was something going on like that at the time. This is one of the reasons him and I actually broke up was because of that issue. She's now in prison. Uh, but at the time when you're going through financial pain like that, you start thinking a lot of thoughts like, well, maybe my partner's in on her, maybe this or maybe that. It caused a lot of angst. And now she finally got in trouble for that. But all I can tell you guys is, you know, she got caught. What if she wouldn't have got caught? Yeah, I just interviewed um, India Roofing Company, and then uh, same thing, fifty, seventy thousand dollars. Those are very common. Yeah. If you watch American Greed, they have a lot of similar stories. Now, this on the sales side, I've experienced all of the stuff, like where the guy <laughs> writes, 
has a homeowner write a check in his name for overhead and profit or um, somebody uh, that's handling a credit card for VIP tickets a couple years ago for Wind the Storm. Well, they, my people back in the day handled a lot of credit card transactions. Well, they, they zipped the card through their own personal thing. Uh, we just found out about it later for a couple of years. It's $3,000, but those are small in comparison to the accounting side stuff that happened, you know, in 2012. But yeah, it's something you got to really, you got to really do your checks and balances on, the, on your account. How many stuff. times, how often out of one, give me a percentage, out of 100 jobs, how often contractors don't get paid? And what do you do when you're not getting paid? When homeowner spend insurance money, doesn't want to write a check or... One, two, three percent. I think it's, you know, I think it's for some for some guys, and this is always the case. Like for me, back in the day when I was a contractor, maybe two out of a hundred. Okay, as a, as a contractor, we were we were very good at one thing that we were good at, or and it was probably me on accounts receivable. Once you once you have a cash flow problem, you don't ever want to have that again. So lean and getting that lean in and sending a a certified letter of a threat to lien, you know, at 45 days instead of 90. We were very aggressive at getting our money on it. And, and most most of the people liked us that we dealt business with customers. But no matter how good you are, you're always going to have a percentage of customers that don't want to pay you and will find out how to not pay you. And in that case, you got to rely on lien law because lien is powerful if executed right. Someone might only owe you $10,000 and you have a half a million dollar home. And if you file a lien, okay, you'll say, well, they got to sell the home. You can foreclose that lien. And that means if you move to foreclose a lien, you don't just file the lien, you move it right after you file the lien, go, go move to foreclosure. And when they get that letter that they gotta go to arbitration and they might lose their house, they magically come up with $10,000 somehow. Yeah. So, happens all but the you time. gotta understand your lien, your lien times and your lien law. And so I think these days, I think there's a lot of education and, 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 and a lot of these new young bucks that are coming up, they've copied the contingency agreement and the sales process from the other company. And they really didn't copy the production, especially the accounts receivable side. And, and if they did copy it, they're getting a, a bad copy from the boss who got a bad copy from the boss from before him, before him, before him. Meaning a lot of guys don't dial in their accounts receivable stuff like they should. And if they did, even how you set your contracts up like, right? Like if you did a, any, any kind of job, even residential over 50 grand, you should set up progress payments. You should have percentage of completion billing policy, which means you have the right to collect at any stage of the job based on percentage of work complete. It's just like they do in big commercial contracts. You don't always exercise it, but if you have these clauses in your contract, it could save you from a cash flow crisis by being able to legally exercise that if you needed to, especially on large jobs, instead of doing half down and half upon completion. So a lot of times AR has to do with the, prog the way progress payments are set up. And so when you hear these stories about, you know, and I love Steve Soule. I mean, he's a great guy. But when you hear these stories about uh, CMR and these other big companies going out, you know, going out of business, like how are they doing fifty or hundred million? How are they going out of business? It could have been ten contracts, fifty percent down, fifty percent when completed, and just those five out of those ten contracts, maybe they're million dollar contracts. They're not getting that other fifty percent for something silly or stupid. And it's stretching out for months, and all of a sudden they just ran out of money because of those I, I know you're things. close with this, Steve since you brought him up. What do you think? Like their biggest problem, do you think, you know, you can get out of the whole like estimation is 50, 70 million dollars in debt on 170 million dollar a year. But now you have big reputational damage because the reviews. The, the I don't I don't know that I've heard that they ran there. They ran into some problems. All I can tell you is uh, Steve, I've known for years since maybe 2001. I mean, long time. He's an honest he's an honest guy with integrity. I think I think you can you can act in your, your best capacity, and you can still run into cash flow problems. And when you delegate to people, and you know they were running a big operation, you have all these managers underneath you. At some point, unfortunately, humans that work for the owner are making decisions too, and things can catapult really quickly, especially in cash flow game. I don't know the situation there to, to be able to comment on that, but I can tell you that the best companies can run into cash flow problems, and it's not always. Sometimes, yeah, it's making dumb decisions with money. Sometimes it's just not managing your cash flow right. And I'd say when you the bigger contracts you have on commercial contracts and you're dealing with insurance litigation, waiting not to get paid through appraisals and litigation like here in Florida, and the Senate bills that passed and making it very difficult now to take on insurance companies down here. Hell, I'm still waiting to get me. 
I'm like, I know everything about insurance and PAs and everything about Senate bills here. I'm still waiting to get paid out the last uh, three or 400,000 on this claim. I, I, mean, I exhausted everything. Um, and that's farmers, they're actually a good carrier here in Florida. So what I'm saying is, I think it's, a con it's probably a combination of a lot of things, but even non-storm, a big retail contractor can run, run into problems. It, it, it all depends on how they're set up to, you know, with their cash flow management, their AR and their AP cycles and what they're spending their money on. So, you know, I can't comment on that particular deal, sure. but he's a, he's a good guy. That everybody says that, and I agree with it. And they, they definitely have a good reputation. It just, when you get to those sizes, like 100, 150, 200 million, the amount of people that are affected by it, you know, homeowners who are not getting a roof, sales guys, like all the vendors, I mean, it's Florida. Someone can go to jail here for that. Like, it's so regulated because, uh, you know, we're not talking about, you know, little things. I mean, people people reach out to us now because of the all the lawyer stuff, all the uh, checks, and people don't want them to do the work, and they try to collect a 25% cancellation fee. So it's, it's a big, big problem. No. You, at the end of the day, you can only go to jail if you perform a criminal action. So there's a lot of gossip and hush out there, even in Florida. You'd have to actually, to go to jail, you'd have to actually perform something criminal in nature, meaning shifted... $10 million into an account overseas or something that should have been used for a homeowner's project. So you can't go to jail for having a cash flow management issue or, a, or, or problems on your control. So, you know, innocent until proven guilty is what I say. Oh, hundred percent. And I'm not talking about like every time you take the money from the homeowner yeah. and you don't do the work. Yeah. But business is, businesses go out of business all the time. I mean, of course, you don't necessarily go to jail but, for but, that. But Florida is very tough on it, yes, like it on is. the contractors, yes, on the contractors. Yes, that, that's is. what I'm saying. Like oh, yeah. if, if it's uh, if, because I have I have a guy in Chicago. He, he had three months in jail over one thousand dollars. Maybe he needed a good lawyer, but he has a felony charges before, and you know he well, has a track took, yeah, If you took money from a homeowner down here and just didn't come back and complete the work, and you have no justification, yeah, you should probably go to jail. But if you took a deposit from a homeowner. And you had liabilities over here and, and lawsuits and cash flow problems and your business literally sucked up that money and you didn't do anything. You, you can't go to jail for that. That's just called bad, 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 bad business management. Two, two different worlds. One is civil and you know, one is criminal. But. but then everybody can do it. Everybody can steal money and say, I just mismanage it. We actually, you know what's funny? We, we ran a story here in Florida. So the, the guy got in the news. So a small contractor got like three, four deposits. Actual news anchor follow him and got a comment from him. He's like, I didn't do nothing bad. You know, I didn't spend money on myself. <laughs> but he took money from three or four jobs, very small guy, didn't do the work. Those three or four homeowners went to sheriff departments, tried to open the cases up. They would not open, they would not prosecute him. And this news lady was so after him. It's like, how is it right? Like he's stealing from, you know, more people. He keeps doing it. And the guy was like, I'm just broke. What you know? I'm I'm broke. I need this money to leave, <laughs> and they finally put him well, in I mean, jail. If he, if he yeah, if he, if he's taking money and not doing any kind of work, then he should, yeah, he should probably go to jail for sure. I just I think I think that whole look. I think that, I think any industry has some bad apples, of course. And uh, I think overall, in, in a roofing industry, in a storm industry, there's a like the guy you just mentioned. It's a very small percentage, I think. 100%. Because it's it's very hard to do that and not go to get in trouble in, let's say, Florida, okay? Does it happen? Sure, it happens all over the country. And it happens from the vacuum clean sales, the guy that sells vacuum cleaners door to door. I mean, it, it, everything, every, every industry has its has its uh, its bad apples. I think I think if you're if you're looking at the storm industry though, I don't think it's any greater than any other industry. I think it's just a couple bad apples. I think it just gets a lot of attention because of the money. And the wow. insurance claims and the insurance companies like to pump a lot of attention on a one bad apple. Um, but if you really look at the, if you want to hear the real crime here in Southwest Florida, just drive here to Naples and look around at all the, all the unfinished roofs and, and messed up roofs that are still sitting here, like my property here. Now I, I'm fortunate I was able to cash flow this thing, but imagine if I wasn't. I can't, you know, there's, there's people still not living in their homes down here and, and there's insurance what, companies what, not paying. What's your take on this crisis? So we have, Quite a few players. You have lawyers, you have public adjusters, you have contractors. You mentioned that we have too many contractors. Do we have too many public adjusters? Do we have too many lawyers? 
in you don't the have, game. You don't have too many contractors here. Not in Florida. In yeah. the rest of the country, you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would tell you that there's very few contractors. This is a ghost town of contractors. Most most of the storm restoration contractors pulled out of here six months ago. Yeah, after oh, they yeah. built oh, yeah. path. Oh, yeah. Um, this, there's just some local guys here now. Uh, very, very, there's no, really no stormers here, even in, so, in Southwest. Do Florida. you agree what lawyers were doing here? What are you on that issue? Like lawyers taking every claim to... Well, it's again, a couple bad apples in every industry. I mean, if you set up every, if every claim was an assembly line of litigation and there were some people that were doing that, where every claim, you know, if it had one loose tile, because Florida's got some of the best homeowner protection laws in, in the country. If you, you do have discontinued tile, uh, you have matching law here. You got the 25% repair rule that they try to change, but it, you know, if the jobs, if the, if it's, if it, if it was, uh, out of code prior to May 1st, 2009, you still got the 25% repair rule. So you got 25% repair rule, you got matching law, and you got discontinued product. So when you add all those things together, it's very easy to get you know some windblown tile um, approved for full replacement, okay? When that becomes easy, what happens is, yeah, you're using those codes and those statutes as a, as a reason to get the entire roof approved. Now, did a hurricane blow through and knock off five tile? Yes. If you apply matching law, discontinued tile, and it's out of code, does the whole roof have to replace under those things? Yes. Okay, so that happened, and that made something. Out back ten years ago, you know, this this was going on since two thousand eight, since coaching. It's good for a contractor here when you when you can use those things to your advantage. But what happens where you where you take it too far is when you're going to that house over there, and it's got a relatively newer roof or five year old roof, and it's got one loose tile. <laughs> Right, and you know it's going to be a fight because it's not the twenty-five percent repair rule, but they just happen to not make that tile anymore. But you could probably put the one tile in, and that's immediately going to litigation the next day after that's you probably. sign it. And now hundreds of those like that are going in. Now that pissed off the carriers here. That did, and uh, that's what that's resulted in Senate Bill two A two two B two D. I can't remember them all. And now the insurance companies took that situation. And then created this much worse situation now for homeowners here where they're not honoring claims and there's not a lot of recourse that like there used to be here to, to, to create that assembly line. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it was, it's a, it's a, it's a domino effect that got worse all the way up. But at the very end of the day now here, there's a lot of, there's a lot of homeowners that are not getting the, the uh, protection and coverage and payments that they should here because now the insurance companies and the, and the Senate bills who bribed or I should say put a lot of lobby dollars into uh, DeSantis and his uh, cohort there, the CFO, I can't remember his name, Patronus. And they, and, they, and they went, what those Senate bills have destroyed the homeowner's ability here to go after their insurance companies and give the insurance companies a free ride. So now it's, now it's, it's much worse here. In, in your years of, um, as a contractor, how often did you use lawyers? How often did you use public adjusters or any third party? I never, I never used any lawyers or public adjusters. Uh, this claim here was the first time I used a public adjuster. Um, back in the day, we we would. I never used AOBs either. We just used the contingency agreement. Sure. And, and quite honestly, do you recommend contractors to use them now? Do like one contractor really needs a lawyer or public adjuster? If you can find a, a really good one and you have a very complicated claim on your your hands. And someone in, in your, let's say you're a new company or you're a new sales guy and you don't know how to write a million dollar claim. Like I, be honest with you on this claim here and this, this log cabin, this property, I could write the roof all day and the gutters and the soffits and, you know, probably even get some sub bids for the windows. When you get into the bathroom remodels here and the plumbing and electrical, that stuff was like Chinese to me. And I had a, and I, when I bought this house, I bought it with an assignment of claim, which was a risky move. It means I took on the onus of the claim. And so I had a time period, I had a window of time period to try to get this claim settled. I couldn't write that claim in exact I'll be honest with you. And I didn't trust many people to do it. So I, I did use a PA to write this claim because of all the in extensive interior damage. And because I was nervous and thought that because I bought the house with the assignment of claim, that farmers might not acknowledge me on a phone and maybe I should use a PA because of all these Senate bills. But it, that was the first time I ever used a PA. And uh, you know, over over the years, when I was a contractor, you know, we didn't even know what a PA was the first ten years when I was a contractor. They, nobody knew what a public adjuster was. That all that all came later after. It's it's just funny to watch. <laughs> after uh, we launched SVG, we we connected all those people. I know, but 
and that's the thing like svg became and all the conferences like you know all the pas come there and it's a big industry and when you need one you need one like i'm pretty sure you're grateful for one here but pas hate to hear that you need them on one out of a hundred claims or two you know they you don't, need, you don't do not need them on yeah you only need them on one out of hundred look and the PAs, I hope some public adjusters are watching this right now. There, ain't, there is not enough public adjusters in America to handle all the claims. The average claim size in America is not fifty thousand or hundred thousand. It's ten thousand. It's less than ten thousand dollars. The average homeowner's claim, somebody look a couple of years ago, was eight thousand six hundred. It's probably ten thousand dollars. Okay, most PAs won't touch a claim under fifty grand. 80, 90% of all uh, homeowner claims. No, l large claims. Yeah, millions and millions and millions of claims are, are eight, 10, 000, eight to $10,000 or $15,000. Um, if you look at the state of uh, Texas, for example, just do the take of Texas, I think if you looked up how many licensed public adjusters in the state of Texas, I think, I'm just taking a while, I guess, 837 last time. That was a couple years ago. Maybe there's 900 in the state of Texas. In 2016, remember that big storm that hit Dallas and San Antonio? Yeah. A half a million homeowners were hit overnight with hail that had sizable three-inch hail claims, real claims, all around 20, 25, 30 grand. If you took those 900 PAs and put them all in Dallas, there wouldn't have been, there wouldn't, they, there's no way they could handle that many claims. So it's 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 a prosperous to think that a PA could be on every claim. Now, first of all, they don't want them all. They only want the bigger ones, most of them. Second of all, none of them are set up to scale to even run a McDonald's of claims handling that would be required to handle millions and millions of claims. Is it a good business claims. to be a public adjuster? Oh, well, it's a regulated, licensed business that allows someone to interface with the insurance company, write estimates, and then create a financial funnel back to their... I think it's a, be a great business to be a PA if, you, if you're in the right market and had the right type of claims because you're, you're getting paid directly by the insurance carrier. That's power. It's very powerful. If a con member of your contractor had, handling claims, I mean, contractors would, would love to be paid directly by the carrier. So the one thing about being a PA is they always know they're get, they're always know they're going to get paid for their work because that money is flowing to them from the uh, from the carrier, just like an attorney. I think that's I think that's attractive. If I was going to be a PA, that's an attractive. If that if that wasn't the case, I don't think there'd be many PAs because you'd be chasing <laughs> chasing your money from the homeowner. Um, PAs versus supplement companies. Like, do you need to supplement every claim? I'm, I'm the personal belief that you should have somebody in your office that understands how to write an estimate, okay? Before you outsource, I've always said that. Now, I'm a, I've been a, a lot of my back in the day exhibitors, supplement companies, Troy Clymer, Balance Claims, PAs are my friends, yada, yada, yada. But at the end of the day, you shouldn't use any of those services until you, as the owner, really you owners, should know how to write an estimate, and if there's a legitimate supplement, send a supplement and then to the insurance company. When you, beat them. you should know how to do that yourself because that's your profit center. And then if you get so busy that you can't do it yourself anymore, you should then sub it out to a supplementing company. A PA should only be used in, in, in certain situations, a very complex and chaotic claim. Uh, unfortunately, the whole supplementing industry blew up because the insurance company started short paying as a, as a group started short paying certain things on claims. That was almost like a textbook, you know, not paying for flashing, not paying for this. Not, and you have to go through this process to get these things paid or incurred costs or ice and water shield, Minnesota. You have to actually show that you put it on and submit a supplement to get your ice and water shield back as an incurred cost. And in, in many times in Minnesota. So by doing these things, the insurance company actually helped create the necessity of a supplement industry because most contracts don't want to sit, and have to send this crap into insurance companies over and over again. But I still believe that everybody should have somebody in their offices that knows how to do this. This is fundamental to running a business is, is your accounts receivable and your, and your ability to write an estimate. And the problem I've seen in the last 10 years, I might be the one that caused it with the WTS and SVG, supplement companies and PAs, but most of these guys set up and they're, they're really good in sales. And they, again, they didn't get the right blueprint for production, accounting, let's say of supplementing, which is really part of accounts receivable. And, and, and they have to sub out because they never learned how to do it and they never mastered it. They couldn't train anybody in their own company how to do it. And the only resource is them to go to a supplementing company, unfortunately. Um, and that's, I don't think that's your question. But there's, there's, there's a lot of reasons why, why it's there, but you should probably use a supplementing company before a PA because a PA should only be used if you have a gregarious, complicated con, uh, claims. A supplementing company, is what I look at as really a third party a billing. Accounts receivable billing yeah. company that's maybe a little better than you. It sent them some stuff over to the carrier, but 
I think you should learn how to do it yourself first and then outsource when necessary. One of the things I never agreed with you is like you have this saying that sales fix everything. Do you still believe that, that sales fix everything? Revenue. That's not necessarily sales by itself. Revenue, which concludes accounts receivable and cash flow, I still believe not everything. I can't fix your heart. <laughs> but in business, no, you could have a cash flow management problem, accounts receivable problem, okay, and you got to go fix those problems and get people to help you in those areas. So, But the best way out of those problems tomorrow is to create new revenue. Remember I told you that story when I said, hey, what do you do on Thursday when you wake up and you're like, you know you're writing checks and the go money's not the in money. your account. Well, shit, everybody's going to show up Saturday morning and go solve an accounts receivable issue, which leads to revenue because revenue can make that problem go away. So when I say that, it means... It's not just go sell more jobs. No, yeah, no, no. It means let's focus on revenue, which could include progress payments, change orders, accounts receivable, sales. But sales usually comes, you know, when you sell, when the act of selling produces revenue usually later. So what can I get for revenue? But re the ability to get revenue is a lifeline of a company, any startup, not just roofing, any, any business anywhere. And to not have revenue sucks. <laughs> so you have to always have a way to get revenue, whether it's sales or going after your accounts receivable or, or, or cash flow or getting a loan or, or me. I just, you know, I sold my company. I had a revenue problem this last year. I had a major revenue problem. I mean, part of the reason I sold WTS SVG was, well, there's many reasons, but I had a revenue problem. I cash flowed this house because this, this claim didn't pay out. I moved my three-year-old daughter here. I went through, uh, I didn't produce revenue at SVG. I downsized my team. I took my whole office. I turned my whole office down because they weren't hitting their KPIs when I was dealing with uh, becoming a full-time dad for the first time. Uh, not first-time dad, but full, first-time full-time yeah. custody, which I never knew what that really meant. With the, <laughs> with the two and a three, you know, she was two then to three. That consumes every bit of your, you know, that's all your waking hours. So... I made some very drastic, egregious decisions out there in Arizona, you know, coming out here. But, but those things had a, a huge impact on my revenue. You know, I was down to zero because I was also cash flow in this thing, which was, this was supposed to be a rehab and flip. It became a rehab and hold. You know, now, now I'm here. But, you know, it was, a, it was a very interesting year. So you talk about revenue. I mean, for me, I was like, oh, geez, okay, what am I going to do? Well, the money's well, not coming in. You have to adjust. You start, yeah, I started floating the idea of... Uh, Selling WTS SVG, and then I also sold solar as a separate, separate. Uh, it was a separate, separate transaction. Deal? Yeah. How many times have you been sued versus you sued someone? What's the balance of losses? Because I know the roofing con uh, contractor business is crazy. You have disputes with the vendors, homeowners, salespeople. What kind of losses uh, you had? I would say over ten. Well, as a contractor, ten years as a you know, well, twelve yeah. years as a contractor. After five to seven million in revenue, so by year two, well, year two we hit twenty-five million. Year two to to the la very last year, eight 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 out of ten of those years got a lawsuit every year. Every year. Oh yeah. What kind of lawsuits? If you if you're doing ten million plus in contracting, you better you gotta just Sale expect a lawsuit every year. Salespeople or homeowners? Or? Um, friv yeah, sometimes a frivolous lawsuit from a homeowner that's maybe they. I remember we did a uh, Columbus, Ohio, actually, w which was a good storm. We did a little Ishi tile roof in Columbus, Ohio, and they didn't like the way the roof looked. <laughs> it was done past code. You know, you, you've seen this. Guy's wife or somebody was an attorney and then sued, and da -da -da. you end up settling. Sometimes these are frivolous things. Um, we've had, uh, I think we had a slip and fall issue once where somebody fell. What's the worst lawsuit you ever have that drained you emotionally, put stress on you? We've never had a lawsuit where we had to go to a... I've never gone to a jury trial lawsuit, like lost a lawsuit in a jury trial, if that you mean. Meaning mo most lawsuits, 90% of them are settled before they go to court. Well, in general, one of the most emotionally draining legal matters was the split up and, and of my partner of, of Apple Air Construction. That was a very... That took a year... It's like a to divorce. build all those jobs and then part ways without it again. It's like going. It's, it's like having a, uh, being married with a prenuptial agreement or, or being an LL. Anybody's got a 50-50 LLC, a partner, and it's your buddy right now, and you don't have an op agreement with a buy sell. Go get one tomorrow because someday you're going to wake up and not like each other. And if you don't have that piece of paper, you have to have exit strategy. You don't. You don't have a way to part. And if you don't get along, you don't have a way to part. It's messy. 
So it took a year to do that, and that was that was stressful. That, but it didn't it didn't go to a there were some threats going back and forth between him and I, but we never we never went to a lawsuit. But it was still very emotionally draining. Um, I didn't I don't you know the Minnesota deal. Okay, I'll tell you one is Minnesota Department of Labor. There's a lady up there. She's probably still there. She likes she likes to do uh, take the contractors down with the fines. We moved a shipment of yard signs from St. Louis to Minnesota. You know, I was a licensed Minnesota contractor. I had a license. But some sales guys from St. Louis had come up and they had some yard signs in their car from St. Louis. St. Louis is not a licensed state. And he stabbed one of the signs out in St. Croix River Valley somewhere. And somebody came by and took a picture of a yard sign with no license. And that lady at the DOLI, uh, God, I, can't, I should remember her name because we went to court with her. She gave me a $10,000 fine for a yard sign with no license on it. Although you could look up and see that I had a license. Wow. And I told her, I said, we have a license. It's on file at the Minnesota State. She goes, you have to show well, it. you have a yard sign without a license. That's a $10,000 fine. So we fought it, and that cost twenty five grand to fight it to find out we got the fine way, but it ended up going to court. And, you know, once you fight it, this particular woman, I, I wish I remember her name because anybody from Minnesota watching this right now probably knows what I'm talking about because she goes after contractors. Um, she starts digging in and trying to find other stuff, to, you know, because she, she knew she was going to lose that fine. You'll and find if you dig in. Once she's on you, you know, she'd dig in, find something that happened in Florida three years ago. It had nothing to do with Minnesota. I mean, she, she was so, that was stressful, but we beat it. I mean, that was the only time we, you know, we went to court and won that deal, but it cost 25 grand. So it's not fun to actually go, you know, it's not fun to go to court. Better to settle. I was thinking about taking you to court once. I'm pretty sure you did. Defamation. Many people did. <laughs> and did it, it, I, I was. But you know what I know? You know what I know? It takes minimum a good attorney. It's twenty five grand, and it's not just the twenty five grand. It's, it's the most... accumulation of data and facts but, and depositions. But, but now you're gonna yeah. Not and if ev- you're and if you're focused on that, what are you not focused on? Revenue. I was listening to Dana White yesterday, and uh, Dana White says uh, so. He has this beef with uh, De La Hoya. You know, De La Hoya was bashing him on the East Bay and, said, and the reporter says, would you consider taking him to court? And he's like, no, we talk like it's a tough business. Uh, we all talk trash about each other. Uh, yeah, I will never do it, but I will do this. I will always respond. And for me, that's brilliant because it, it, with the media, like the best way and, you know, Dana White was trashed by De La Hoya. Like, you're not paying your fighters and stuff. Here's the facts. And I tell everyone, like, you, you can go and create a video about well, no, me. By the way, we're gonna, when we come back, we're going to talk about some of those things that you said. No, no, sure. You know why? Because 100%. some of them were true. 100%. Some of them were inflated. The, but, the, the, but the point is, if you talk about me, I can reply. And that's the only thing you can do. And people will see the truth. Because if it's a media space, the best way is to deal with the media space. That's just my take.